I don't know if, um, just in case you can't tell or you haven't noticed, God is doing something in this church. And I'm so excited about it. I, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be um, sharing tonight. I know that without a shadow of a doubt, God has put what I'm going to talk about on my heart tonight. He's put it on my heart. He put it on my heart for me, I'll tell you that, recently here. But when Pastor Justin asked me to speak last Wednesday night, it was just, it was, it was so perfect. It was just confirmation, you know, because it's not just for me. It's, it's for the church entirely. It's for the church, and I'm excited to, 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 to be able to share. I'm, I'm uh, just privileged, a little nervous. But that's okay. And I'll be the first tonight to stand up in front of you and acknowledge that I completely understand I have a long way to go. So I don't stand. The Bible says, don't think more highly of yourselves than you ought to think. As Pastor Justin just alluded to that thought. And I stand humbly before you tonight I, I, just to be in this position period, before you or before anybody, it's a humbling thing and I don't take that lightly. I, 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 never, I never do when I get this opportunity, which isn't, a, which isn't often, but when I do, it's humbling. I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 11 and God, I just trust that you'll help me tonight. Jesus, to be your mouthpiece. God, just to disappear tonight. I, I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be heard. I just want you to be heard. God, we're so blessed by your presence. We're so blessed, God, by your goodness. God, we don't deserve anything that you've afforded us, Lord. And Jesus, I just pray humbly, Lord God, that you would anoint my mouth in Jesus name. Hebrews 11:13 through 16 and then again 24 through 27. Hebrews 11 as you all know the chapter of faith faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen and it goes on it says it says by this the elders obtain a good report. It talks about few Abraham Sarah, Enoch, Abel. And then we come to verse 13 and it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly or an eternal. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. Verse 24, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And I want to stop and touch on that. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We know that Egypt in that day represented all the world. It represented society. Mainstream society. Egypt was it. Egypt was the center of the world, you might say. And Moses, having been rescued by the Pharaoh's daughter, found himself at a place at the age of 40. You know, when it said that he came, he came of years, he came to years. And he says, by faith, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't want to be a part of the world anymore. He didn't want to associate with the society anymore. 
He, knew, he, he realized who he was. He knew who he was. And he didn't want to associate himself with where he had been. It says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Choosing rather to suffer the afflictions of the people of God. He had it made. Comfortable life. Everything he wanted. Probably didn't have to suffer a thing. Easy life. But he, ref- he, he, he turned his back on all that. He said, that, he said, he said cho- choosing rather to suffer afflictions with the people of God to the, enjoy the pleasures of sin for a, st- for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the war- reward, or he was looking to the reward. Disregarding the comfort of the life that he had, disregarding the easiness of where he was, disregarding all that, it says, for Christ's greater riches. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward, or he's looking toward the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He didn't care what he looked like. He didn't care what people thought about him. He didn't care, because you, you remember, he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter, okay? So he was, in, I'm sure he spent a lot of time in the king's court. I'm sure, he, I'm sure they knew each other. First name basis, even, maybe. I don't know how they did it. But he said, not fearing the wrath of the king. You can imagine, when he forsook Egypt, the king probably was puzzled. He's like, we raised you. You belong to us. Now you're leaving us? And I'm sure it upset him. I'm sure the kings didn't, didn't, weren't forsaken all that often, especially in, in Egypt in those days. He recognized who he was. He recognized who he was and he forsook it, not fearing the wrath of the king. And this is the main gist of my text. <clears throat> For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. The na- if, I, if I'm going to title this message at all, it'll be called Stamp Eternity on My Eyeballs. Stamp Eternity on My Eyeballs. I want to see Him who is invisible. We have to, as a church, as a people of God, as we are, God's children, God's church today, we have to see the eternal. We have to see Him who is invisible. We have to or we die. We have to or we will just fade back into into the the abyss of our easy lifestyle, of our easy society. It's been, you know, just everything that's been preached here, you know, recently in the past few weeks and months, you know, is just God has just been stirring up my heart. I know He's been stirring up others as well. And um, I even told Hannah in the first part of this year in January, I said, something feels different about this year. I have no idea what it is. I have no idea what's going to happen or, 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 or how it's, it's going to happen. But something feels different about this year. And I don't know that any, any, I don't know anything, but I'm just in my spirit. My spirit is so stirred up. Something feels... If... All you have to do is, is turn on your TV or watch, read a headline. Read a headline that pops up on Facebook. Anything. And you know, it doesn't take a theologian or a scientist to figure out things are messed up right now. Messed up. You can choose to ignore those things. 
doesn't make them go away. Things are messed up right now. Okay? And if we don't see in the eternal, hey, you're, we're, we're going to be sucked in with it. But that, and, and, and what I'm trying to say is my heart is stirred up that we're in a war. We're in a war. What happens in war? There are always casualties in war. Always. There are always casualties in war. But, assuming it's a just war, and obviously, in our case, as a church of the living God, it is a just war, those casualties are always for the greater good. They're always for the greater good. Now, you have to think of what I'm saying spiritually to, to, uh, for it to make any sense. But Moses, it says... He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, if the casualty of this war may be a simple pleasure of life, maybe something that, maybe it's not even innately sin, but it draws you away from God, it, sh- it clouds your vision. It, it, it hinders you from being able to see in the eternal. And guess what? When you can't see the eternal, everything weighs you down. You, you can't be free. How can you be free? And, and how can you be free and believe everything that you see? Well, you can believe it because things are happening. But how can you be free and be caught up in all that? You can't possibly be free. The negativity that is being broadcast from every single angle. Guys, we're, we, have to se- we have to separate ourselves from this or else we'll become just like it. Second Timothy 2.4 No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who's called him to be a good soldier. No man who wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Now, maybe you don't war. It's time to start. It's time to start. I'm preaching like I said. God help me to say what I'm saying with humility. I'm preaching to myself. These are God stirring my heart with this, but I know that it's not just for me. I know it. No man war that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who's chosen to be a soldier. <clears throat> last year, late last year, I guess it was November, I've, sh- I've only shared this with a few people. But it really became reality to me that that I better get it together or, or I, won't be, I won't be anything for the Lord, I'm saying. I better do what I'm supposed to do. I better take this thing seriously. I better take this thing seriously or I'm going under. And for months in 2013, the Lord was dealing with my heart on... A certain issue and I don't mind I don't mind sharing it I don't mind sharing what it is but the Lord was dealing with my heart through the Word of God through devotions through my wife on TV and I'm just I'm not here to be deep or anything like that I'm just to, I'm just here to talk and tell it how it is but God had been dealing with my heart about TV. Now, watching TV and sitting in front of TV, I'm sure most of us, 95% of us, have TVs in our house and we watch TV. There's nothing innately sinful about watching TV unless you're watching the wrong things. That's a whole nother ballgame. But there's nothing innately sinful about sitting in front of TV. Okay? But, I knew for, for a few months 
that the Lord was prompting my heart to cut the thing off, just to get rid of it. And, you know, there were excuse after excuse after excuse and all justifiable things, and I just never did. I just never did it. Just never heeded what the Lord was saying to me. And during this time, and like I said, nothing innately wrong about watching TV. I'm not saying everybody needs to go home and turn your TV off. I mean, that's between me and God. This is just an example I'm using. But over these months, man, I was just, I found myself going deeper and deeper and deeper into the dumps. Just failing God. And just like empty and thirsty and just barren inside. And one day, I think it was, it was some point in November, you know, when the victory was just nowhere to be found. Now, not questioning my salvation, just the victory in life, just the victory, you know, to, to overcome, just to live, live life, you know. And so I was driving down the road and I was just, I found myself just desperate. I found myself crying out to God, literally going down the road. God, what is going on? What's going on? Why, why, why do I feel like that? Why are things like this? What's going on, God? And I promise you, not 30 seconds went by and I knew it was God as clear as anything. He said, you haven't obeyed me. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. I wasn't thinking about it before. But all he said was, you haven't obeyed me. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. And I repented. I repented as humbly as I could. And I put my foot down and I said, okay, okay, God. And you know what? He brought to my remembrance King Saul. I'm sure most of you know the story of King Saul. King Saul was God's man, anointed of God to be the king over Israel. God gave him specific instructions after he defeated the enemy to, to, to destroy everything, kill everything, animals, everything. Well, Saul disobeyed. He kept the animals back. Now, he had a reason. He had a justifiable excuse and this is what he told Samuel. He said that he kept those animals back to give sacrifice to the Lord. Good thing, right? Yeah, but not if God told you to do something else. God told him to do something else. He didn't do it. He disobeyed God. And what we know, God removed the anointing off of his life completely. He ended up going to sorcerers and witches and ultimately falling on his own sword. Total demise. Total ruin. Why? He disobeyed God. He didn't do the simple thing. He had a justifiable good reason not to. But God told him to do something else. And so when I'm, the, the reason I'm sharing that is because we have to humble ourselves and obey. We have to humble ourselves and obey. We cannot as the church think for any moment that we're re above reproach or that, you know, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I go to church. I do my thing. Hey, I'm in ministry. That's not, that's, that doesn't get anybody anywhere. That's never gotten anybody anywhere. You can be, you can be full of, of Scripture and everything and you can just be a form without power. It's like we used to have a surveillance camera, camera at a Dullam house. Man, that thing looks so real. Uh, that thing would trick everybody and anybody who came and didn't know what that thing was. But it was nothing. It wasn't nothing. It was just a shell of a camera. It was nothing. Same thing with us. Without humility in our lives and obedience in the simplest things, even the simplest things, we will never see eternity. I, I, don't mean, I don't mean we won't make it to heaven. I mean we won't live with eternity stamped on our eyeballs. We will be overshadowed and overwhelmed by every negative thing that this world can throw at us. 
I, use the, uh, I want to use a, the example of, of a thermometer and a, and a thermostat. Uh, some of you may have heard this, this metaphor before, I don't know, but it, it was perfect. You put a thermometer outside and it, it, it fluctuates. It, it does whatever the outside is doing. Whatever its environment is, is what it will be. It will tell you. If it's 95 degrees outside, it's going to be 95. It goes up and down and it always changes. Well, there's a thermostat on the wall right there. And the thing about the thermostat is it's hooked into a power source. Okay? You put that thermometer at what you want the atmosphere to be, and it doesn't change. It creates the atmosphere where it is. How does it do that? It's hooked to a power source. Now, you can take that thermometer, listen to this, you can take that thermometer from outside and bring it in and stick it right next to that thermostat and guess what it'll do? It'll go right to what that thermostat says. Take it back outside and what happens? goes right back to what it was. It's just a thing. It's not connected to anything. It's not connected to any power source. It stands alone. Guys, we don't stand alone. We don't stand alone. We have a power source available to us. The other day, Hannah went to town to um, just get out of the house, I think. I don't know. And she had Frankie and there. I think they were just riding around. Well, she went to the, there's, a, there's an Indian food store in Montgomery, right next to, um, right across from where the Eastdale Mall is in a little strip mall. In the dead middle of, Mont of Montgomery on Atlanta Highway, middle of, middle of our town, Montgomery. And, you know, she parks, gets out, go in, middle of Montgomery, familiar, everything, just deep south, whatever you want to call it. Goes into the Indian store, and what hits her? The smell? Completely foreign. The sounds? She says the young guy behind the counter had Indian rap playing. Not American. Foreign. The, sound, the smells, the sounds, everything she's seeing, the, the writing, I'm sure most of it was in Hindi. The people, their, the way they're dressed, everything about their little nook right there was Indian. They completely succeeded at creating their atmosphere, their little place in the middle of the deep south, in the middle of Alabama. Because why? Because that's what they are. They're Indian. They're not, aff they're, they're, they're not affected. They weren't affected by our culture, our society. They're Indian. So guess what? In their area where they were, it was all Indian. And I'm sure wherever they go, they look Indian. I mean, hey, come on. Yesterday at the thrift store, this Indian guy comes in. He's got a red dot on his forehead. I mean, you know. You know what he is. You know who he is. You don't have to think about it. You already know. We have to be that. We're the church. We're the church. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Colossians 3, 2-6, through 6, Set your affections, set your affection, or strive for, or seek, or regard things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Mortify or die to your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, 
I'll stop there for a second. Inordinate affection. That's one of those that I'm not, I didn't learn in school. Inordinate affection. A feeling which the mind suffers. This is the, the uh, Greek translation here. A feeling which the mind suffers. An affliction of the mind. Emotion. Passion. In either a good or a bad sense. Or passionate deed. You know, our emotions will deceive us. Hey, if anybody has to deal with that, I do. Our emotions will turn us the wrong way, guys. We have to keep those in check. It's, that's, and that's what it's saying here. Mortify your members. Evil concupiscence. Lust. Covetousness. Greed, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. This is not a game. This is, this is the command of God. This is the Word of God. Now, I thought of this example. When Jesus left, He was resurrected. He was with the disciples. Made Himself known. And then He left. They were all there. It's around about 500 or so people. All there at Bethany. And He left. And they're all standing there. You know, I'm sure they're, they're mourning. They're sad. They're probably tore up about it. You know, their Messiah. The, the, the one, the King. He's, the King who came. He, he's leaving now. And the angel said, what are, you, what are you looking for? Go tarry in Jerusalem. Do what Jesus told you to do. Well, it says 120 of them went to an upper room for 10 days. In other words, they separated themselves out from the rest of society, from the rest of the chaos, from the rest of all of the turmoil and the just everyday happenings of their society. They closed themselves in an upper room for 10 days. 10 whole days. Now, think back. Try, and I, I tried to do this and I really couldn't. Think back 10 days from now and try to remember every single day. It's not a really short amount of time. I'm, probably most of you can't probably do that. I couldn't do it. So, but they separated themselves for 10 days out of obedience because God told them to. And we know when they came out of that upper room what happened. They transformed the whole world. They transformed everything. They were different human beings. They separated themselves from society and from everything. In obedience to God. Seeking God. Earnest in prayer. And they came out of that place and they were completely different when they went in. Completely different. They were connected to a power source now. They were connected. Now, our society, and when I say our society, I'm talking about Western society. I'm spe more specifically the United States and more specifically the Bible Belt. We have dumbed down Christianity to fit our society. That, people, is a sobering thought to me. Our society's version of Christianity looks nothing like what the first church looked like. For the most part. For the most part. Looks nothing like it. Rather than being, we've dumbed it down, rather than being the witnesses of Christ's resurrection power. The church is put forth in God's Word with great power. They gave witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ with great power. With great power. So many, so many have a form but no power. Just methods with no connection. 
You preached it Sunday. We have to have that river. Methods aren't enough. People say, you know, this is just my life, you know. You know, God knew I was going to be born here before the world ever... That's true. That's true. God knew I was going to live in America. God knew, you know, that things weren't going to be like, you know, in America like they are in other parts of the world. God knew all that when He put me here. This is just my life. No, sir. This is your eternity. And this is the eternity of all those around you as well. Regardless of where or when God is, He's the same. He's the same. Regardless of where or when God is. Co can tell you what it's like. Going over there, what was it, like a week or two after you left that place in our, our Pakistan? They blew it up right where you were? This is, this is the world we live in. We happen to be so sheltered here. We happen to be so distracted. Distracted from eternity. Distracted. We have to keep eternity stamped on our eyeballs because it's not just our life. It's our, it, it is our eternity. I don't want to stand before, before Jesus at the last day and see all of the riches of His glory and His grace and stand there and say, God, I don't know anything about that. I don't... I'm just a welfare recipient in the sight of all your riches. I don't know anything about that. I want, to, I want to know of all the riches of the fullness of His grace. And I want to know. I want to walk in that victory and see the resurrection power of God and witness it and testify of it as I believe we do in a sense. But guys, there, there, is, there is such a higher plane for every single one of us. There is such a higher plane, a deeper place in God that, any, that, that we're all experiencing. I don't care who you are, there's a deeper place in God for you to go. I want to read a testimony of an individual that it was really, really kind of neat how I came across this. We were, um, we were reading or watching a uh, Leonard Ravenhill video a few nights ago, and um, he began to talk about a, a, um, a vision or um, I guess a prophecy, you could say, that two different completely unrelated, separate times, separate everything, individuals both said the same thing, which was in, you know, in these last days, in the great outpouring before Christ's return, one billion souls will be swept into the kingdom of God. One billion souls. And that was tested, that was witnessed but from two different people at two different times, two different places. One billion people will be swept into the kingdom of God. And he pointed over an individual on the video. Now there was a, a crowd, it was like a pastor's convention or something, and there was a crowd of people, and he pointed over, and he said, um, called the man by name, and he said, and, and, and the second guy who, who said this, said it's gonna, he mentioned your area of the world. He's, he was a Romanian. It just, just so happened to pan over to the man and put his name on the screen so I was able to see who he was. And so I ended up looking this guy up. But he said, he mentioned your part of the world, Romania. And obviously this was eight, 1989. So still the Soviet Union, I think right before the, the wall fell and everything. But things were a little bit different there then. But he said, your part of the world. Um, and he said, Crimea, Ukraine, Romania. Right there where all this turmoil is taking place right now. Coincidence? Judge for yourself. I don't think so. But anyway, so I looked this guy up and lo and behold, this is what I found on him. It's a Romanian. His name is Joseph Son. T-S-O-N. 
And I found this article, and I'll most likely be closing with this. He said, Joseph's son recounts God's grace amid suffering. And you know what was so amazing and so neat about this to me? This article came out of Birmingham, Alabama, 2004. Feel free after I'm done to, to, to take it. It was late. It says Joseph's son was fully prepared to die. It was late in the summer of 1977 and Romania was under communist rule when the Baptist minister put all his worldly concerns in order after the manner of a dying man. Buoyed by the courage of his wife, Elizabeth, son prepared himself for certain martyrdom. I don't read any of this to bring any fear or anything like that in anybody. The only reason is to encourage us that we have to have eternity stamped on our eyeballs, guys. Or, like I said, we're going to be overshadowed by what this world throws at us. We're going to be overshadowed. We have to have eternity in the forefront of our vision. He was, he did, he was to meet an officer from the secret police in the restaurant of a nondescript Romanian hotel. The communist officer had pledged to do what previous secret police officials had failed to do, silence Son's ministry by offering him a secular job in exchange for a promise that he never again would preach the gospel. Turning down the job, this is our generation. This is like right now. This is current day, okay? Well, 30, 40 years ago. Turning down the job spelled at last hard time, at least hard time in a prison camp. It might very well mean execution. Son met with the man and without flinching turned down the job. I told the man, now I'm ready to die, Son said. You said you were going to finish me as a preacher. I asked my God and he wants me to continue to be a preacher. Now I have to make one of you two angry and I decided it's better to make you angry than God. But I know you, sir. You cannot stand this kind of opposition and you'll kill me in one way or another. But I accepted that, and you should know that I have even put everything in order and made ready to die. But as long as I'm free, I will preach the gospel. The communist officer was equally unflinching in his response. He, he told Son to go and preach the gospel. He, the officer, made up his mind that if I was ready to die for it, then I should, ha then I should have it, Son said. And for another four years, until they exile me, I continued to preach with nobody disturbing me because that man, a key man in the secret police, decided I should be free to preach because I was ready to die for it. Son related his testimony at, uh, as one of the keynote speakers during the 22nd Annual Southern Baptist Founders Conference um, in July at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama. 2004. With the theme, The Fellowship of His Sufferings, Son's testimony is one of both grave persecution and the grace of God. He was arrested and imprisoned several times in Romania during the 1970s and charged with being a Christian minister. Each time he underwent several weeks of intense interrogation, beatings, and mind games before finally being exiled from the country in 1981. When the secret police officer threatened to kill me, to shoot me, I smiled and said, Sir, don't you understand that when you kill me, you send me to glory? You cannot threaten me with glory. The more suffering, the more troubles, the greater the glory. So why say stop this trouble? Because the more suffering, the greater the glory up there. Romans 8.18 8, I reckon not that His present sufferings would even be worthy to com be compared to the glory that's to be revealed in me. During one particularly harrowing session of inter interrogation, Son told his inquisitors that spilling his blood would only serve to water the growth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Part of the theology of suffering he learned was that tribulation is never an accident, but is part of God's sovereign plan for building his church. This guy had eternity stamped on his eyeballs. I told the interrogator, you should know your supreme weapon is killing. My supreme weapon is dying. Now here's how it works, sir. You know that my sermons are all on tape all over the country. 
when you shoot me or crush me, whichever way you choose, you only sprinkle my sermon, sermons with blood. Everybody who has a tape of one of my sermons will pick it up and say, I better listen to that again. This man died for what he preached. Sir, my sermons will speak ten times louder after you kill me, because you kill me, and because you kill me. In fact, I will conquer this country for God because you killed me. Go on and do it. Dying for the Lord is not an accident. It's not a tragedy. This shocked me. This shook me. He said, it's part of the job. It's part of the ministry. And it's the greatest way of preaching. What do we know of this? I want to know about that. I mean, I don't want to die if I don't have to, but I want to have eternity so stamped right in front of me that to live is Christ and die is gain. Literally, I want to take myself out of my comfortable little Bible Belt church life and be a Christian like Peter was a Christian. They lined people up in the streets just so his shadow could touch them. That's resurrection power. He was a witness to that. And the world was transformed upside down. Forget, forget society. Forget the threatenings. Forget that stuff. We're Christians. God's the same yesterday, today, and forget forever. I don't care what you think. Because the Bible says it. And it doesn't matter what you've been taught or where you've been taught or who's told you it. If it wasn't the Holy Ghost it wasn't, and didn't line up with this, it wasn't true. I'll skip down a little bit. He recalled being encouraged by a valuable truth that a British theologian taught him. The cross of Christ was for the propitiation of sins, but the cross each Christian is called to bear is for the propagation of the gospel. Amen. I'm finishing. I'm finishing. Believers must be ready to give their lives if necessary. Now, this, this guy literally was facing death going underground, okay? But you know what? We've, every single day we face the decision to give our life, right? To give our life. So take this in a literal sense, but more so, take it in your everyday life. Take it in the, in the, where you're at right now. Your greatest weapon is dying. Your, our greatest weapon is dying. Believers must be ready to give their lives if necessary for the perfection of the church, son said, because God's grace spreads when the church suffers in the manner of its Savior. It's the job of Christ to protect this church, but I am come to say, my Lord, I give you my body to suffer through my body to complete your sufferings for the perfection of your body, the church, son said. <clears throat> we have to be set apart. We have to be set apart. You know, God's grace is so amazing. And His love, we're inseparable from His love. But there is a higher place for every one of us. Like I said in the very beginning, let us not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Please, let us just be humble. Humble before God and humble before one another. And obedient in the littlest of things. Don't make excuses for disobeying God. Don't make excuses. Thank You, Jesus, for Your sacrifice. Thank You, Jesus, God, for giving Yourself. But thank You, Lord Jesus, for giving us Your Word. Thank You, Jesus, for giving us Your Holy Spirit to inspire us, to empower us, Lord, to give us courage and boldness. You know us, Jesus. You know who we are and what we're made of.
We need you. We need you, Jesus. Lord, I know that Peter, of all people, God, he denied you three times, blatantly, outright denied you. But God, he was a different man when you came to dwell inside of him. He was completely different. God, make us different, Lord, than our surroundings. God, connect us to your source, Lord. God, let this river flow through us, Jesus. God, you know that we don't even have the strength or the understanding in ourselves to get in the river, God. That you have to put us in that river, God. God, like that man at the pool of Bethesda, God, he needed you, Jesus. He didn't need a stirring of the water. God, he just needed you to come by. God, we just need you to come by us. I need you, Jesus. God, we need you. Jesus, church, just worship God. We <laughs> need Man, tonight, amen. Let's just worship the Lord. Hallelujah. And we just stand in, in His presence. Oh.